right here, please. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. My name is Sebastian Zemeck. I'm a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon University. And this is a very special talk for me because it concludes my PhD at Columbia, Uni uh, Columbia University. And I had a chance to work with some wonderful people there. Uh, I collaborated on this work with uh, Jia Lee, Jung Tae Kim, Steve Bellovin, my advisor, and Tony Jabara. So this is work on cross-device tracking. What is cross-device tracking? Cross-device tracking essentially means that analytics companies and advertisers try to identify which of multiple devices belong to the same person. And this has to do with the fact that many people who use the internet use it on multiple devices. And so it reveals a more complete picture of a person if they are able to see all the devices of one person. And there are various other reasons why that is useful, apart from realizing the full uh, personality and interests of a person, which is, uh, for example, frequency capping. So maybe advertisers want to show an ad to a person only for a certain number of times, and if they don't know that uh, two devices actually belong to the same person, they uh, would be shown all, all over again. Uh, another reason is that the, um, the, 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 the journey through devices of a person might lead to a conversion, uh, for example, a purchase of something um, at some point, and advertisers are interested to know when did this um, conversion actually start? Where was the initial trigger that led someone to buy something? And ultimately, it enables advertisers and analytics companies to get to know users better. And so that's, that's the whole um, point of cross-device tracking. And some of you may have heard of a very particular case of cross-device tracking. There is uh, ultrasound tracking. So that is, for example, um, if a user watches a television ad, there is an inaudible sound. And that sound is picked up by a mobile device. And then the advertiser knows, OK, um, this person is now sitting in front of the TV and is watching this ad. And so this, that's one special case of cross-device tracking. And in this work, we are considering uh, the, the cross-device tracking space in general. So there are some very specialized ad networks that make use of this practice. Two of them are Drawbridge and TabAd, and they are what is called probabilistic cross-device trackers. So they don't have a first-party relationship, but rather they need to rely on machine learning to identify whether users are the same person on different devices. And that is, for example, different for deterministic cross-device tracking companies, which we um, see, for example, Facebook uh, um, here, where they have a dedicated login, and it's, it's easy for them to see, OK, this person is logging on, in on this device and another uh, time on another device. And uh, Google also um, recently, um, about a year ago, um, had a blog post where they said, OK, we closed, we closed the loop. And um, uh, now it's possible to see uh, offline um, purchases, but also uh, the view of a person across devices. And so this is a, this is a space where you have um, very specialized ad networks, but also the usual big internet companies. What we are going to do in this talk is first, um, I would like to describe a data flow experiment that can help to identify cross-device tracking. And then I want to describe the, uh, the algorithm that we developed. And we are analyzed this based on a data set that we collected from 126 users, mostly from Columbia University, mostly students. And 107 of them had histories for both desktop and mobile devices. And based on that, we developed an algorithm to see how well 
we could identify whether these devices belong to the same person. What can be learned from cross-device tracking data? That's another question that we asked us. Because ultimately, if you have a bigger picture of a person, then you might be able to learn more and learn more completely um, about that person. And um, for that purpose, we asked users, for example, what their interests are. Um, we asked them for uh, what their persona are. A persona is something that uh, is uh, you know, very common in ad networks. So for example, you can target ads towards a soccer mom or a football fan or a book lover. And um, based on that, um, we try to learn wh whether, um, whether somebody has special interests. Um, Cross-device tracking is something that is not a niche, but rather that is a mainstream thing, and that um, is, is something we will show here as well. Um, there is self-regulation. So for example, the Digital Advertising Alliance has a requirement that ad networks and everybody else who engages in cross-device tracking has to mention that in their privacy policy. So we looked into the privacy policies of various companies and assessed whether they comply with this requirement. And then in the end, um, I, I placed these results into the whole you know, big picture. So um, the, the data ex flow experiment that we conducted began with a desktop browser and a mobile phone that we connected to the same modem at the same router. So from the outside, they appear to have the same IP address. And then we browsed on a fresh browser on the desktop computer various websites. These were mostly websites from media companies such as the LA Times website, for example. And we observed the ads that were served to us. And then we categorized these ads into Google ad categories. And once that was finished, we switched to the mobile device. And in the, in the mobile uh, device, we then uh, searched for certain, um, certain uh, items to buy. So for example, here's a, here's a little um, excerpt from the search history, buy pet food, um, buy a watch, um, buy a refrigerator. And then we clicked on the ads um, that were, or the, the links for the ads that were shown on the Google um, search page. And then um, we observed on the desktop browser what kind of ads um, were served to us. And um, we found that there was a statistically significant difference in the types of ads that were served. So um, here, here are some examples. We received uh, the PetSmart uh, ad and uh, also ads for buying a watch and buying a, um, um, yeah, uh, uh, you know, I guess that's related to the refrigerator uh, appliances in general. And um, so that, that, that makes us believe that actually these ads were targeted to us based on the history um, of the desktop browser. Now what is interesting is that um, the other way around um, did not seem to work. So we tried to browse on a desktop and you know, try to pretend to you know, buy, want, wanting to buy certain products, but we were not shown um, ads for these products on the mobile device. And so that could have different reasons. It could be that this only goes one way. So it's, it's generally known that people switch from a smaller to a bigger screen if they want to buy something, but it's rare the other way around. It could also be that um, we just missed uh, the campaigns for the certain items that we wanted to buy. So you know, ads um, are not you know, run uh, indefinitely, but you know, it's maybe uh, for three weeks or you know, uh, a, a certain amount of time, and um, we, we might have missed this. And it would be interesting, definitely, to um, have a more um, comprehensive analysis of this phenomenon. 
Now, it's difficult to understand exactly how cross-device companies work. And we uh, resorted to um, reading patent documents, in particular these two that I'm showing you here. Um, that's one uh, patent application and a patent of two companies in this space. Um, and essentially what a patent is, is that uh, the inventor discloses an invention to you and then has the right to practice that invention for a certain amount of time. And so they should be described in a way to be understood and to um, be uh, you know, uh, implementable. And so we took, we took what we could learn from these patents and um, uh, developed uh, with some major features from, from those uh, our, our algorithm. And it basically works the way that you have first to identify devices and secondly match these devices. So these are the, the two really big steps that, um, that need to happen. And so um, first, when you identify a mobile device, then you compare the similarity to every desktop device um, that you also see. And the one with the highest similarity that is above a certain threshold that you determine um, will be matched. And then you can take this device pair and add it to your device graph. So this device graph that is, you know, known under various, you know, proprietary names, but that is essentially what these cross-device tracking companies try to build. And um, now, if you ask, okay, what, what, what are the features that are used to match? One that is very well known is IP addresses. So if a device connects to one IP address and another device connects to the same IP address, there is a, you know, good chance that this device, that these two devices belong to the same person. So that, that is very well known. And that is also what we used here. And you can see some of, of the results here for our, our data set. And another uh, feature that we used that is uh, maybe a little bit less known um, is um, to use URLs. So if someone has an interest, for example, in uh, you know, football, um, it's, it might be that that person visits you know football sites on, on all of their devices it might also not be maybe you know devices have a dedicated purpose and then um, you know this this assumption would not hold but in many cases it holds and for example if you look at um, uh, quantcast um, website analyses then you will see that um, they are around I believe 17 percent um, of uh, users on average visiting a site both on their mobile and their desktop device. And you can see the results here. So this is the second um, uh, most um, successful feature. And then you can try to map mobile apps to desktop device sites. So for example, you can take the package name, um, com Facebook, uh, Katana, for example, and match that to Facebook. And that, that still also has some signal. And when you combine these three stages and you run this algorithm that I just described for each feature, then these are the results you get on our data set. You can use different similarity metrics. You can use different threshold values. And um, that is really where the, the difference is made here in this particular case. And that is something that is very important to advertisers. So what I'm showing you here is the, the curves for depending how you set the uh, similarity thresholds, you get different, um, uh, different results in the sense that if you increase the threshold, your precision will become uh, better, that's what you see in the first picture, but uh, on the other hand, your recall gets you know, weaker. And so that's a care careful trade-off because on one side, um, advertisers want to say, okay, we, we are very precise. We, we know exactly, okay, th these, these devices belong to that person, but on the other side, you also want to have a lot of reach because maybe your audience is very specific 
And then if you exclude too many people, this audience is no longer in your data set. So that's, that's really the challenge that they are facing. And what you can see here is, um, for, for example, if you select the um, you know, threshold um, of uh, 0.2, um, then, then you would reach an F1 score of um, 0.74, and you can try to play around with these um, different parameters and features and try to get you know, better results. Now, what can be learned from cross-device data? If I have cross-device data, is that any better than just having data from one device? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, we tried to um, answer that question at least for you know, some, um, some interests and some personas. And in this graph, um, what you can see is the ROC curve of um, having an interest in finance. So we asked our participants in our study, okay, do you have an interest in finance? And if you only take the mobile data, um, uh, you know, you get, the, you get the curve on the left. If you take desktop, um, that's what you get on the right. And if you increase the feature space and, you know, possibly get some more meaningful features, then you can slightly improve the results. But um, it, it turned out clearly that if you use both, that you can um, do much better. And so there, there is this instance, and um, we, we found this also for another instance, for example, value shoppers. Um, you can identify better if you actually have um, both types of data. Now, that does not seem to generally hold. So, for example, we had the prediction of gender, and that was about uh, F1 score of 0 0.8, and it didn't matter much whether it was based on both types of data or one or the other. So, it seems that for some instances it helps and others it don't. Here are the more um, concrete results um, for, for an interest in finance. And um, if you're interested in the, in the others and more, then um, you know, I, I uh, encourage you to, to go into the paper. One interesting footnote um, is that we um, found that actually device usage as such can also be an interesting signal. So we collected our data during the Jewish holiday of Passover. And uh, we had some observers of Passover in, in our, um, in our uh, participant pool. And um, initially it wasn't quite clear um, you know, what, what the reason is. Um, but I, I asked them, okay, are, are you not using your device? Uh, is, there, is there a problem, a uh, technical problem or something? And then it turns out, okay, um, if, uh, you know, if you observe Passover, then um, uh, you're not supposed to use electronic devices. And, um, in this case, um, it was very clear that um, these were the Passover observers uh, because they didn't use both of their um, electronic devices. And so um, maybe there's one person who doesn't use one or the other on some time, but if you really have somebody who doesn't use um, any electronics at all um, during this time period, then um, th there's a reasonable guess that maybe it's because, in this case, uh, of observance of Passover. So even beyond the, beyond the content, beyond uh, URLs and app usage, even the circumstances of device usage um, can play a role here. And the more devices you observe, um, the better you might be able to predict. We found a total of um, 9,732 desktop trackers and about a third of that uh, of um, uh, mobile trackers in our data set. And they had an intersection of 2,571 trackers. And now um, we required to be a cross-device tracker that a company also claims on their website that they are actually doing cross-device tracking. And we confirmed that for 124. Um, and so that is either they have an app and a desktop website where they do cross-device tracking, or they have a mobile website and a desktop website where they do cross-device tracking. And to give a little bit more an idea of um, who these companies are, so it's, it's, um, it's pretty skewed. 
um, as, as it is generally the case in advertising. So you have the, the really you know, big companies such as you know, Google um, and Facebook. And um, interestingly enough is that Google has the um, furthest reach. Um, uh, so for the average user in our data set, the you know, Google Analytics and Google Display um, cover around 50% of the sites or apps they use. And um, the interesting part about Facebook is that they nearly have 20% insight um, throughout. So desktop web, mobile web, and also apps. And I think that, that is um, what distinguishes them from uh, Google in this space here. And then you have lots of smaller companies. Some of them, that's where you see these little bumps um, um, focusing on mobile in particular. These are some of the domains in our data set that occurred the most. And um, these are mostly media websites. So what in the big picture this tells you is that um, it does not necessarily to be does not necessarily need to be the way that one website has these trackers on both of their mobile and desktop version, but there seems to be a tendency a little bit into this direction, although we did not find anything statistically significant in terms of this. Now I want to um, address one more topic: Does self-regulation work? Self-regulation. Um, as I mentioned, means that there is guidance for the companies who are part of the Digital Advertising Alliance to disclose that they're doing cross-device tracking, and that is actually now mandatory. And so we looked into the privacy policies of these companies, and um, we found out of 40 randomly selected companies that 17 omitted mentioning cross-device tracking in their uh, privacy policy and we contacted them and um, you can see the results here. We received the response from seven and um, two pointed us to other documents and that, that was actually correct. So they had, they had described this elsewhere and um, uh, one said, okay, we are actually not doing it. We're just, you know, <laughs> having this on our website so that our clients know, okay, we are, you know, up to date here and um, we are in the course of implementing that. And um, three others said that they will change their policy, and um, one said that they are not violating anything. And um, without contacting us, contacting us five um, changed then their, their policy, and obviously we have no way of knowing whether that's you know, due to us getting in touch with them, um, but, but it's, it's now compliant. So it seems that um, you know, there, is, there, is, um, there is some compliance, but also there needs to be more done, and obviously one can also argue whether the po privacy policy is the ideal um, document to disclose this kind of practice, whether consumers are really aware and whether they make uh, use of reading the privacy policy. <coughs> now, if we, if we take a step back, cross-device tracking is tracking in the Internet of Things, and so the more devices become connected to the internet, I think the more we will see um, cross-device tracking. And um, as I hope to have convinced you here, it has substantial privacy implications. And often cross-device tracking is seen purely as a machine learning exercise. And um, I think the privacy considerations have to be also um, examined further here. And that, that is something we, we plan to, go, uh, to do going forward. And um, uh, ultimately, the question is, all these things coming together, how can a user, in a usable way, try to control the tracking? And maybe a personalized privacy assistant, whether that is in form of an app um, or um, uh, in, in, in another form as part of an IoT device, um, can help here. So the data set um, will be made available if you're interested in that. And um, with that, um, I'd like to take your questions.
we have time for a few short questions. So we have the mics. You please come up. Um, hello, uh, from from Stony Brook. So. Um, it's um, so my in my experience. So cross device tracking is quite well known right now. So do you think that um, I didn't hear you mention anything about the third party cookies? They use a lot of cookies to track. Um, so in your research, did you look into that part at all? Like yeah. Yeah. So the the third party cookies. Um, this is um, maybe you can go back to the. So this these are essentially included here. Um, and, um, you know, they, they can be, for example, um, in form of like a widget, like, you know, like on Facebook or something like that, right? So that is all included here. Yeah. Okay. So uh, do you think like uh, private mode in browser could help at all with this problem, like uh, when you browse those websites? Yeah. Essentially, I, it's, a, it's a good question. I was thinking about, you know, defenses as well. And uh, essentially, I think um, all the defenses against, uh, you know, tracking, that, that is what you would try to use if you want to avoid, avoid uh, cross-device tracking. I think there are some special cases like this cross-device tracking through ultrasound. And, you know, for that, um, um, you, you would need to have, you know, special defenses. But for this normal, you know, traditional cross-device tracking, uh, the normal defenses would apply, I think. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Phoebe Rouge, FTC. Uh, this is really interesting work. Um, so I, I have two uh, pretty quick questions. One is, uh, when you were looking at the trackers uh, and cross-device trackers, did you find evidence of actual um, unique identifiers shared between desktop and mobile? Uh, and the other question is, it sounded like you were using participant data for your websites, and did you notice that there was any difference with the number of websites that people visited and you know the accuracy and, and whether that had any influence on the result? Yeah. So we, we looked um, in our initial data flow experiment. We analyzed the data. And so what we found was that there was cookie syncing, but it was between um, two desktop websites. But we did not observe anything between desktop and mobile in this sense. I mean, there were identifiers in there, but uh, like, you know, um, device IDs, things like that. But um, these, these normal tracking mechanisms, they, they didn't, we didn't observe it through, um, you know, across devices. Um, and on your, on your second question, could you, uh, could you specify yeah. that a little bit more? So uh, my understanding was that you use participant data, so you used uh, actual user website yeah. traffic. Um, mm -hmm. So the question was, did it vary between participants about how many pages were actually in their history? And if so, did that have any effect on how your algorithm worked? Right. So you, you mean in general, right? Okay. So. Um, there was a big difference. So um, many people, they, um, they used, for example, on their mobile phones only apps, very rarely websites. Um, and for some others, it was the other way around. They, they didn't use any apps you know, much and you know, used a lot of websites. And you have lots of people who you know, visit the very popular site, and then you have uh, you know, some who, who visit very intricate sites. So, um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to analyze, and I think that's also why we uh, why we make this data available because it's an interesting data set, and um, you know we anonymized it, but um, it's still it's still valuable because you can um, so the the connection between the sites is maintained, so um, sites have the same um, identifier, and I think that that might lead to further research also. Thank yeah. you very much. All right, um, so. There are no further questions. Um, let's thank uh, Sebastian again and the other speakers as well. Thank you. So, very nice talks. Um, and by that, uh, we also conclude the uh, privacy attacks and defenses session. And there's a coffee break now. Thank you.